Okay, uh, in the next five minutes is all I thought I had left. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, w I wanted to uh, give you some um, details of, of, what, of the characteristics of, of the uh, cell of the pneumatopoietic and, and the immune system in Wiscott Aldrich syndrome. And also to try to explain some of the tests that, that we do uh, both to characterize immune deficiency and also to, uh, on, the, on the research basis, uh, uh, sometimes to try to characterize a little more uh, the, the mechanism that, that lead to immune dysregulation, immune dysfunction in, in this disease. And I wanted to start by giving you this uh, uh, repre schematic representation of the hematopoietic and the immune system. I will just remind you that in, in the bone marrow uh, of our uh, bones, uh, we have these hematopoietic stem cells, uh, cell types. And they give rise to all cells uh, of, of the blood, uh, both the cells of the immune system, they are uh, depicted here, the lymphocytes, the T cells, you've heard, you, you've heard many times, the B cells, the, the NK, natural killer cells, that orange, we'll talk about those uh, on Friday, and the other cells of the innate immune system, and neutrophils uh, and uh, eosinophils, you know, I'm sure you have heard, and, and other cells that are obviously very important in, in the blood, like platelets and red blood cells. Uh, as you know, uh, patients with Wiscott uh, have problems with their lymphocytes and with their platelets and red blood cells. And, and since these cells in common have these progenitor cells, you know, we, we know and it has been demonstrated uh, that the problems really start here and uh, they develop and they express themselves throughout the uh, differentiation of these cells. So, why are these cells defective uh, in, in, in Wiscott? It's because, as Hans was saying, uh, there are many reasons, but one of the fundamental reasons is because Wiscott, the Wiscott Aldrich syndrome protein is necessary for the skeleton of the cells, what is called the cytoskeleton. And if you stain uh, the cells for uh, actin, which is the, the component of a, of a cellular skeleton, you can see the normal cells, this filamentous uh, picture uh, that, that depicts the skeleton. And if you look at these uh, platelets uh, in, in one of uh, Dr. Thrasher's publications, you see these uh, nodules, uh, these bright nodules in, in these normal platelets that are made of actin, and those are missing in the, in the platelets from, from Wiscott from uh, patients, indicating you know, that the absence of the, the expression or the function of, of the Wiscott protein uh, uh, as, as a consequence, a, a fairly major uh, abnormality here. And since the cell immune system need actin and actin cytoskeleton for a whole lot of different functions, you, you can try to, to begin to understand how you know, the different phenotypes that, that we see, the different clinical presentation that we see in Wiscott patients are due to this uh, lack of uh, uh, Wiscott Aldrich syndrome protein function. You know, the cells need photosomes and microvilli to move around, to interact with the, with the, with the microenvironment. Uh, the uh, ANS mentioned immunological synapse, this, this is fundamental junction between a, a, a cell's immune system, two, two cells immune system that, that triggers the immune response, and the cells also need uh, uh, the acting cytoskeleton to perform cell division or cytokinesis. So uh, having a problem with that protein you know, uh, obviously results in a series of problems at, at different levels of the, of the hematopological immune system. So talking about platelets uh, uh, as one of those cells, you all know that the problems with platelets in WISCO present themselves with PTQ bruising and bleeding. And when we look at the, at the CBC, we, we see low platelet counts and small platelet sizes. You know, these are uh, the low platelet uh, results in, in, in this kind of, of presentation. And uh, this is just picture of control platelets, uh, antic donor uh, control plates. you see they are here, they're much smaller than, than the red blood cells. In Wiscott patients, you have seen this already, they have some, some normal size platelets, sometimes even larger platelets, indicating some uh, problems with, with uh, platelet generation. But mostly, uh, they have these small size platelets. 
Yes, we, the patients have low platelet count, and they may be, may be uh, um, explaining the bleeding, but we also know that some patients that have been splenectomized continue to bleed or have uh, a hematomas and, and bruising. And that is because there is also some uh, platelet function that is, that is abnormal in, in whisker patients uh, that is uh, described here. Uh, platelets, when they attach, when they attach, you can put platelets on a glass slide and they will spread, they will come from this star shape into this more round plate, uh, shape. In, in Wiscot, uh, in the absence of the Wiscot protein, you see that many, f much fewer platelets uh, perform that function. So there is a, a problem with the function of the platelets, and, and since spreading is, is one of the um, uh, functions that the platelets need to do to create, uh, um, uh, stop bleeding, that, that is relevant. So why do we have these platelet abnormalities? We certainly have an increased problems with increased consumption, reduced production, and abnormal function. So all, all the, fa of the factors that, that uh, uh, support platelet production and function are affected in this disease. You all know uh, that platelet, risk of platelets are cleared uh, from the circulation with a, with a velocity that is higher than normal. And we all have told you the spleen is responsible for this uh, removing of the platelets uh, uh, faster than, than normal because the platelets are abnormal in shape and, and they are recognized as foreign objects. Um, there is certainly uh, a problem with, with production. Uh, studies in mice have shown that the, the the, the uh, progenitor cells that, that make platelets produce and release these platelets in, in, a, uh, in a premature um, fashion and in, uh, in a premature uh, way, and, and that may, re may reduce the efficacy of the production of, of these platelets. And one of the uh, uh, representation of, of this factor is that <laughs> One index that we have now started to use in, in, in the lab, the immature platelet fraction index, is much uh, lower in whisker patients than normal. So the immature platelet fraction uh, measures these platelets that are young. They have been just released from the, from the bone marrow. And you expect those uh, platelets to be higher in, in, play, in patients that have low platelet numbers. So if, in fact, if you look at ITP patients, patients that have immune thrombocytopenia, you see an a, a average immature platelet fraction of 6.46, which is within the normal range. In whisker patients, which also in general have, you know, on average have less platelets than the ITP play, uh, patients, you have a lower uh, immature, play, immature platelet fraction uh, index, which indicates a, a reduction of production. And then, uh, you know, we also have a problem with uh, aggregation spreading and the presence of important granules at, in, in, inside the, the whisker platelets. Here are uh, some uh, the, uh, rep representation of uh, alpha granules that are, that are uh, the cor corpuscles inside the, the, the cells that uh, contain important molecules for a patient uh, platelet aggregation. As you see, whisker platelets have a reduced number of those granules. So uh, the, the problem of bleeding and, uh, and, uh, uh, and, and complications from bleeding in, in whisker is, is due to many different factors. And, and obviously, the, uh, we know that we can correct uh, we know we, we can correct this with spectrometry. You know whether or not is the right thing to do. Uh, well, I'll leave it to the discussion later. But we know this can help. And uh, whereas for the reduce redu for reduced production, obviously there is the, pro the, po the possibility of using platelets uh, uh, growth factors. And when Dr. Bissells would will discuss this for a normal function, I believe there is no nothing else to do rather uh, than. Uh, bone marrow transplantation, they would, they would call, they would uh, 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 correct this. Talking about uh, the lymphoid system, uh, you, you know, if you heard that T lymphocytes can be low in number, especially CD8 positive cells can be reduced in numbers. 
And when we put them in, in um, <coughs> culture dishes, they, they fail to proliferate as vigorously as normal uh, T cells. And they also have a problem with killing uh, uh, target cells. And that obviously can be a, a, a problem for uh, control of infections and, and malignancy. We have seen in, in looking at T cell numbers in patients uh, uh, of different age, the WISCO patients, as Hans was saying, with age, uh, their immune system can uh, um, um, get un under a trite, right and, uh, and you see the WISCO patients' uh, T cell numbers are lower in patients that are older uh, compared to what happens in, in uh, normal controls. And as I said, the, the, the problem with low numbers and reduced proliferation and reduced killing can explain the increased infections and malignancy. Hans also mentioned the problem with re reduced regulatory T cell function. Regulatory T cells are this subgroup of T cells that are very important because they control the proliferation of other T cells that when they are left unchecked can cause autoimmunity. I'm going to show you a little bit of what uh, the way that we study regulatory T cells uh, in the laboratory. Uh, so we <coughs> culture some T cells, these effect, we call them effector T cells, the cells that uh, are uh, being stimulated to respond to a, let's say, a viral infection. When we culture those cells by themselves, they proliferate with a uh, up to 12,000 in, in this value of proliferation scale. When we culture them together with these regulatory T cells from a normal control, as you see their proliferation is, becomes half. So the, reg the regulatory T cells are able to reduce the proliferation of, of, of these T cells, and that's their job. Unfortunately, when we culture WISCO uh, T regs with these effector T cells, as you see the proliferation is almost unchanged. And, and that is, uh, the mechanisms that are behind this ph phenomenon are not totally understood yet, but this clearly indicates that some of these uh, proliferating T cells are left unchecked and may go on to uh, cause autoimmunity. Look, talking about B lymphocytes, uh, it was just mentioned, um, it's very common for whiskered patients to have abnormal IgA levels in, on the increased side and lower IgM levels. Uh, and, and this, is, uh, this, uh, this um, reflects the immune dysregulation of this disease. One thing that is clear from, from many studies that have looked at uh, patients and, and uh, mouse models is that there is a differentiation defect of these B lymphocytes. If you uh, rem rem remember the, the picture of the hematopoietic system that I showed you earlier, the B cells are deriving from a, a common lymphoid progenitor, but they also they have to go through a series of different, different steps to become mature functioning B cells that produce normal antibodies. What we know is that if we, um, looking at differentiation of, of, of these B cells, is that naive B cells, so the cells that have not encountered a antigen, they are usually normal in numbers and in percentage in, in whiskered patients. But if we look at other more sophisticated or more uh, specialized subsets of, of B cells, uh, we look at there are a series of problems in, in whisker patients like an increase of B transitional B cells. These are the young B cells that are moving from the bone marrow uh, to the spleen. Uh, so for, again, reasons that are not completely understood, there is an increase of, this, of these B cells. Since these B cells contain autoantibody producing clones, that is also is, is, uh, taken as, as an as a ex explanation of why uh, autoimmunity can be uh, uh, a problem in WISCOT. Memory B cells are the cells, the B cells that have encountered the antigens and now are producing antibodies. As you can see, uh, in general, uh, WISCOT patients have less B cells, so they have a less effic efficacy in, uh, in, pro in uh, go undergoing that process of maturation. And then a, a, a very common finding in, in WISCOT patients is this increase of this particular subsets of B cells that are CD21 low. 
Uh, we still don't know what that means in Wiscott. In other diseases like common viral deficiency, the presence of these B cells has been associated with autoimmunity. And therefore, you know, what we have been doing is to just to, uh, for the time being, just uh, look at the numbers of these, of these B cells and see that if they can tell us that a patient that has this high, uh, high fraction of, of C21 low B cells is that patient that will, um, uh, will develop autoimmunity. We don't have a clear association as of yet uh, uh, regarding this, uh, this matter. So all the issues with B cells, again, can underlie the increased infections and autoimmunity in, in WISCO patients. Now, if also, I've already told you, you know, there are B cells in, in WISCO patients that make autoantibodies in, 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 uh, in uh, um, so, this, so that is another issue that we have seen. And this is a study that Dr. Montalangelo did with uh, comparing a series of WISCO patients. You can see there are WISCO patients, uh, mild WISCO patients uh, in, in, the, in this series. And he compared this, uh, these uh, subjects with patients that have lupus, uh, so patient, a disease that is um, characteristically associated with all the antibodies, and compared with healthy donors. So what you see here is very clearly the, the, uh, the lupus patients have a lot of yellow. Yellow means presence of autoantibodies in their serum. The, all, the healthy donors don't have almost any yellow, uh, yellow square, but the whisker patients and the, the severe whisker and the mild whisker patients, they both have several dots uh, that light up in yellow showing an increased presence of autoantibodies in, in these patients. And, and, uh, the, and Gigi can, can tell me if, if, uh, if he shares this uh, comment, but the unexpected part was this in, uh, so the presence of autoantibodies in patients with mild disease that also don't have autoimmunity because they have mild disease, but they can already pre-exist potentially the development of autoimmune uh, phenomenon in, in the future. So again, the presence of antibodies is classically associated with, with autoimmunity, but perhaps can be used again to try to predict uh, what patients need to, be, uh, com uh, need to be followed more closely for the development of, the, of that kind of disorders. Um, I'm gonna go very quick here now. Uh, I think it's happened to many of you uh, that a CBC has come back with hemoglobin that is on the low side of normal. And obviously that creates uh, some uh, concerns because uh, autoimmune hemolytic anemia can be a problem in, with, uh, with whisker patients. And if you have autoimmune hemolytic anemia, it means that you have a more severe version of the, of the disease. Uh, so we always, we've always followed these values very, very carefully. And what we have noticed is that several patients, almost all patients that we see uh, ha show um, blood smear abnormalities when we looked at their blood cells, red blood cells now, under the microscope. As you can see, uh, it, this a normal red blood cells is like this one, it's round and, is, is, and, and has a center, a, 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 a lighter center where the biconcave uh, shape uh, uh, squeezes out hemoglobin from the center. As you can see, there are many different and funny looking cells in, in the uh, blood smear of almost all WISCO patients that indicate the presence of an abnormality with the red blood cells. And when we looked at uh, index, indices of, um, 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 what do you call it, uh, uh, hemolysis, uh, we saw that in several patients we have actually evidence of, of such uh, occurrence. As you see, these, these are, when we looked, this is a series of 25 patients, 12 patients had lower than normal hemoglobin. They had increased, um, they reduced aptoglobin. Aptoglobin goes down when there is free hemoglobin in the, in the, in the blood circulation. And the plasma hemoglobin was increased in 15 out of 25 patients. So in, uh, we certainly had in, uh, pr um, evidence of subclinical non-immune hemolysis in 18 patients, which I think is it's something very important to know because 
not all hemolysis uh, indicates autoimmunity, uh, and therefore, you know, we can we can uh, uh, rest a little easier when we see those lower uh, values of hemoglobin. And one, this, these are um, pictures from the mice uh, with the with the genetic deletion of the WISCO gene. As you can see, they also show those those abnormalities, and that's good for us on a research basis because we can try to uh, understand what, what, are, what is the function of WASP in the red blood cells that uh, creates these problems when WASP is missing. So I'm going to go the, to the questions. I think some of these were platelet questions that Hans has already uh, discussed. Um, The issue whether or not you demanding treatment when the cancer gets so low is a, is a tricky one. Uh, I, with cancer there are 5,000, I would be very uh, nervous to let someone go without doing anything, especially if they have to get on a plane and, and go back home for a long, for a long trip. So uh, it, it certainly uh, it, it, it depends on uh, what you are and when, and when you are, when, when these numbers are, uh, are given to you. Um, I, I agree with Hans, uh, uh, trans, uh, transfusions are the last thing to do, but again, sometimes you have to do it. And uh, if, that, if, if transfusion is something that, that happens too frequently, that may be an indication that something, something curative uh, needs to be done. Uh, so that, that, that's, a, that's my take on that. And again, I also have not heard about this uh, happening, so I don't, I don't know what to say. Probably it's just that uh, if the counts are down because of, of an of a infection, it, it might be uh, feeling under the weather because of that. Um, I talked about T cells, uh, so uh, there was this question it was, it was just presenting now. T cells are normal in counts, but uh, they might not work properly. Uh, so that, that's why we do those assays to see if they can uh, reduce the proliferation of other cells, if they proliferate normally, if they produce cytokines. The, the cell number in itself is, is not just, it's not the whole story. We need to find out if they work properly. They, they, can I interrupt? Yes. Well, there are, there are, not everybody responds to hepatitis B anyway at that, at that age. Uh, so it's not, it's not necessarily a whisker problem. Um, it's possible that some of the T cell function is not working and is not therefore the B cell function, the B cells are not responding uh, to a vaccination. Uh, but that is, I would say most likely, it's, it's, I don't know, but possibly it's just a non-responder for other reasons. Um, is there a possibility that T cell function can be normal in a classic patient? I guess we need to discuss what T cell function uh, means and what, what studies have been done to call it uh, normal. A classic patient, uh, I would expect that at least would, would not respond to, a, to a, a, a stimulation to a KT3, possibly is not producing IL-2, so I, I, again, it depends <coughs> what assays have been done. Have been done. The age of the patient, yes, it could, it could be. We have seen patients having normal responses to OKT3 initially, and, that, uh, and they have been become less, uh, less of responders later on. Um, what are the causes of the changes in white cells, platelets, and protein? Uh, I think I said some of the answers about that in my, in my uh, presentation, but if, if there are questions, I can answer them now. And I'll stop here. No, take questions. Um, so we will go in media res, as we say in Germany, <laughs> right to the to the uh, root of this uh, disease, which uh, was a German guy with the name of uh, Wiskart. You see him on the left, and I'm probably the only one who actually met him. Uh, <laughs> uh, when he was retired, and I was a fellow, actually I was a resident 
uh, he was retired at the University of Munich. And his picture, this kind of picture, was hanging in the, in the hallways of Children's Hospital, which is called uh, the Haunusche Children's Hospital in the, in the Lindwurmstrasse. So uh, Wiskard was not an immunologist. He was not even an infectious disease guy. He was a pulmonologist and a part-time hematologist. Uh, why was he not an immunologist? Because there were none at that time. Immunology did not really start, uh, at least uh, related to immune deficiency, until uh, the Second World War when IVIG became around and immunoglobulins could be measured. Uh, Viscard only could measure platelets. And so he had these patients from one family, three kids, who uh, had, um, so he called it familial, with three boys. Uh, they had thrombocytopenia and he actually looked at the slides and he saw that the platelets were small. Uh, the kids had eczema and bloody diarrhea, and uh, one or two had otitis media, and they all died in the first uh, two years of life. And so he called it um, Morbus Valhofii, with a question mark, which is what the name, the German name for ITP, and he knew it was not ITP, because if you look at platelets, here on, on the right side, you see normal-sized platelets, and if you have ITP, these platelets are actually much, more, much larger. But these kids had a few larger ones, but most of them were very small. And that's the reason why we don't count them. The reason now our platelet counts are so low and the, platelets, the patients don't actually bleed, and there was some question about it, because our machines don't count the small ones. They only count these few larger ones. And so, uh, you know, that's one explanation why a patient who has maybe 5,000 platelets counted by our machine is not bleeding uh, seriously uh, because he has all these little small platelets, which uh, I call platelet dust. So, Wiskott, uh, that was his, his uh, electronic medical record <laughs> here. Uh, uh, child A, child B, and child C. And they all had eczema, and they had colitis, otitis is one, they had edema, and then they got severe diarrhea, and here he died. The other one had also colitis, eczema, and that one has otitis media also, and this one had um, um, uh, rhinitis and eczema <coughs> and uh, infected, infected eczema and colitis, and then they all died sort of in between the first and the second uh, birthday. And that's how he uh, described the, the eczema. It was actually generalized uh, in these kids, not limited to just uh, the anticubital area, which you see often in atopic patients. And uh, that was his, his first paper, which he uh, presented in 1937, uh, not at an immunologic congress, not an infectious congress, but in a hematologic congress. And that was his, the pedigree. You see the three boys and the girls were okay, so he called them familial. He didn't call them inherited because that was in 1937, Nazi Germany, you were not allowed to have an inherited disease. That was a no-no. And then the other mistake he makes, you see, he, he concentrates on the fathers. So that, these two guys were, were uh, uh, he concentrates on the fathers. He did not say it was X-linked because, why did he not say it was X-linked? Because the X chromosome was not discovered yet. It took 20 more years to discover the X chromosome. And I remember it was in high school when our teachers came excitedly and explained to us two things. One, that there was X and Y, and it was the, the man's fault if the woman didn't have a boy. Because in the old days, it was always the female. And the other thing, what he said, you know, it's funny. Humans have 48 chromosomes like the tomato. And they made a mistake. It was 46. But at that time, there was a, a count done. And they thought humans had 48 chromosomes. Actually, had 46. So now that's what we call viscous Aldrich syndrome XLT in 2015. Uh, you see that sort of more or less the case for the XLT, X-linked thrombocytopenia, and that is the entire picture. Uh, 
uh, with bloody diarrhea, recurrent infections to immunodeficiency. That was not recognized until the late 60s when Max Cooper uh, studied these patients and recognized that they had an immune deficiency. And then when these patients uh, survived longer, you, one identified them as having autoimmunity and malignancies. And uh, of course, then we thought about how to treat these patients. And these are important additional findings that were not recognized until the patients survived into their teens. And that is a whole list of autoimmune problems. Almost three quarters of the patients, uh, when they get old enough, will develop Hemolytic anemia is the most frequent one, but also vasculitis of the small and large vessels, neutropenia, small, low numbers of white counts, arthritis, inflammatory bowel disease, and especially in, in, in uh, Japan, there is a high percentage of patients, patients which develop IgA nephropathy, and they look like Henlock vasculitis. And uh, they have also higher incidence of food and drug allergies, and that's a really a problem for some patients with uh, Piscotaldrich syndrome. And then, of course, mainly B cell lymphoma is a, a problem for these patients. And that, that is a picture which uh, Fred Rosen gave me, uh, taken in the 60s. And you see that this child is miserable. Uh, and he died six months later of a lymphoma. And, and you can see uh, he, had, he, he was really uh, uh, very sick and not feeling well, and that was because we didn't have good antibiotics, we didn't have good antifungals, we didn't have IVIG, and, and uh, uh, the life expectancy at that time was quite low. In the 60s, less than th three years, 2.8 years in a series from Max Cooper. And then in the 70s, when we got better antifungals and antivirals and IVIG, uh, the life expectancy was 11 years, and currently for classic viscots without transplantation, it's maybe 20 to 30 years, and those are the kind of problems uh, that uh, lead to death in these patients. And that, that's a patient who just uh, uh, entered college. Uh, he, uh, you can see he's pretty happy. He, he was diagnosed early in life because the gene was identified. Uh, he uh, was prepared for bone marrow transplantation. You see he had eczema and he has bleeding. But he looks pretty good. He went through bone marrow transplantation without problems from a sister and uh, uh, is now a healthy 20-year-old boy. Uh, and what, what is wrong with their immune system? Uh, this is an old study which I did as a fellow. Uh, this is an immunization to a fake, a fake immunization, bacteriophage spikes 174, and that is a, a, a log scale, so it's 10 times higher. Uh, if you immunize here and here, you can see that normals increase their titer over a period of time, four weeks, and uh, then you give a second dose, it goes about 10 times higher, and you give a third dose, it goes even higher, and then they, the normals, they switch, from a primary response, which is IgM, to a IgG response, isotype switching. After a third immunization, almost all antibodies IgG. And look at, at uh, uh, uncle and, and his cousin. Uh, they, they make a, a primary response, but then they fall down to almost zero. They have no immunologic memory. You give them a second dose and a third dose, and they don't increase it, and they don't switch. And that is because WASP is required for, I think, for this interaction between T and B cells, this is a B cell response, and this is a B T cell response. Uh, they got help from T helper cells, and they don't because WASP is important for cell-cell interaction, for antibody responses, for, for instance, killing the NK cells, the natural killer cells, can form a synapse with the target cell, and the same thing is true uh, for uh, regulatory T cells and that's why they have a lot of infections. So I, uh, and then in, in, in the um, 80s, uh, the gene for Biscot Aldrich syndrome was mapped to the X chromosome. That's a small end of it, that's a large end. You can see there are several other X-linked diseases like X-linked agammaglobulinemia, X-linked skid, uh, hyper-IgM syndrome, and CGD are all on, on, on the X chromosome. And then when the WASP gene was discovered by a fellow in Uta Franke's lab with using cells for cell lines from our patients, the, the gene was discovered. This is just sort of a uh, um, 
a schema there are, you can see different domains which are all important for the function and you see here the different mutations where they are and what type they are these these open circles those are missense mutations uh, they are usually mild and the closed circles are nonsense mutation they have no protein uh, those are usually the severe cases deletions and insertions and I will get to that so there is some uh, correlation between uh, the type of mutation that results in the presence or absence of protein, but if the protein is present, it's still not work, uh, working properly. So uh, what does this gene and the gene product, the protein, do? So the gene is a, a, a medium-sized gene. There are some that have 40 or 50 exons. So this is a, it's easy to sequence, about 500 amino acids, so it's a, it's a good-sized protein. And uh, the, the gene is transcribed into messenger RNA, and that tells you where the gene is active. And the messenger RNA is exclusively, exclusively expressed in hematopoietic cells. So although the gene is in, in every cell, but it's only transcribed in mRNA and, 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 uh, trans, uh, and, and, and into protein in cells from the blood-forming uh, system. And it's located mainly in the cytoplasm, where it plays a role in actin cytoskeletal remodeling, but it's also a small amount, isn't this, on the membrane. That's where cell cells interact. And it can even be found in the, in the nucleus. And there is a hypothesis that it helps actually other genes to be downregulated or upregulated. And uh, so it participates, as I mentioned, in this immunologic synapse, which is an area where cells interact with other cells on the surface of, of uh, the cell. And what does WASP do? I already m mentioned it, uh, it, it is involved in this actin polymerization, cytoskeleton, so it, it makes cells move forwards and backwards, and it's a very, very uh, uh, delicate regulation of this uh, actin polymerization. Uh, it has essential functions for cell locomotion, move, moving of cells, cell trafficking. Uh, it's very important for signaling with other, talking to other proteins in, inside the cell. And so this immune so, uh, synapse formation between T and B cells, I already explained to you, between uh, 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 dendritic cells and T cells, also uh, between uh, uh, NK cell, natural killer cells, and target cells, and regulatory T cells. And then, uh, th that's what I was trying here to say, that uh, it's involved in the cytotoxicity of these natural killer cells and CD8 positive cells that bind to target cells, virus-infected cells, malignant cells. And the function uh, that are important for adaptive and innate immunity and immune surveillance. So it, it has a very central role in the immune system. It dabbles around in all these uh, uh, unique parts of, of the immune system. And that's why it's such a complicated disease. Uh, so, so what's the dif immune deficiency in, in the Viscot Aldrich syndrome? It, it depends on WASP expression to a large extent, but there are some exceptions. Uh, there is a significant antibody deficiency, so if you have a patient with classic Viscot Aldrich syndrome, they should actually get IVIG because they cannot interact, the T and B cells cannot interact, and they make a poor antibody response. There is uh, abnormal checkpoints for T and B cell maturation, which results in autoaggressive B cells. So they develop B cells that, that cannot distinguish between self and foreign, and so they cause autoimmunity. Uh, up, oops. I'm getting ahead of myself here. How can I get forwards here? Backwards. Is this a backwards? Eh? Is this good? Okay, oh, it's on that side. All right. So, so um, the other the other phenotype, in, in addition to the classic viscous aldrich, is this so-called X-linked thrombocytopenia, and these are patients from uh, Dr. Albert in Munich, uh, 
and you can see two brothers. Uh, they have the same uh, the same mutation. Uh, three year, t mon uh, ten months old. Uh, they have, uh, they have this amino acid substitution. They have all throm thrombocytopenia. Very little eczema or no eczema and no immunodeficiency. Uh, a very mild form of Viscot Aldrich syndrome. And if you look at the mutations. Uh, this uh, is a group of XLT patients, and you see most of them have these open circles in exon 1 and 2, uh, which results in amino acid substitution. And these are some splicite mutation which allow a, a little bit of normal viscoid altered syndrome protein expressed. And these are the mutations which we find in classic viscoid altered syndrome. Most of them have uh, either missense mutation or insertions or deletions that result in the absence of protein. And that's a study which, uh, which uh, uh, Dr. Albert has spearheaded in, in, in 2010, uh, showing that if you look at a large group, 173 uh, patients with XLT, their life expectancy is quite encouraging. You know, this is a normal German uh, life expectancy of men, and they are essentially the same in classic, uh, in the uh, X-linked thrombocytopenia population. But if you look at the so-called event-free survival, that means how, how long do they get along over, over time before they get a, a, a serious event, you can see that this is pretty miserable, and only 25% never had any serious problems. So it is not a completely benign disease, but it is a, a, a disease which patients can, can live with. And those are some of, of the problems patients accumulate infections, you know, again, that's over a period of time, that's a percent of patients. So about 25% uh, of XLT patients get serious infections over a lifetime. And bleeding, it's also interesting that the bleeding, although it's about uh, between 25 and 30 percent, the serious bleeding <coughs> stop at around 25 years of age. And I always wondered if this is because the average Westerner is no longer active and sits in the couch in, on the couch <laughs> in the front of television. But it's, it's amazing that there were no serious bleeds uh, between 28, 28 and, and 75. Uh, autoimmunity, you can see, it occurs in XLT, whereas in, in classic viscoid Aldrich, about 100% will develop autoimmunity, and many will develop malignancies. Here, it is about 50% develop autoimmunity, and about 25% will develop a malignancy, usually a lymphoma. So, you know, if you get this, this is a problem. And so, we still are debating what to do with patients who are identified as X-linked thrombocytopenia. And, uh, you know, gene therapy is something to watch for. Uh, uh, bone marrow transplantation is very safe. Uh, so we have another. Uh, you have another five minutes. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that that is a patient. Two families from Gigi who studied uh, uh, two families with intermittent X-linked thrombocytopenia, and they have uh, either normal or low platelets coming up and going. They have the only problem they really have is intermittent petechiae. They have no, no serious infections, no autoimmunity, and no malignancy so far. And that's, that's the lower limit of normal. You can see they are sometimes up and sometimes down, and nobody knows why they, probably a virus or something comes and, and uh, uh, they, they do not uh, uh, reach normal levels, and they have perfectly normal amount of OS protein, but it's an amino acid substitution, and it's almost what we call a, a, a SNP, a, a, a zinc nucleotide a difference that may not be very meaningful. And there is another phenotype which I wanted to share with you, and that's congenital X-linked neutropenia. Due to mutations in, in the WASP gene, they have congenital neutropenia, maturation of rest of myeloid cells, uh, in the infections characteristic for neutropenia, not for viscot, platelet size is normal, they have no autoimmune disease, one patient in the literature has developed lymphoma, and uh, there are, however, asymptomatic family members with the same mutation, so it's not completely penetrant. And I just wanted to, to tell you about this the principle here. Normally, WASP is self-inactivating. It sits there and it bends the, 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 the distal end over and it's not active. And if something happens, 
that, uh, that a, a, a gene is phosphorylated. Now this, when it's phosphorylated, it, it sort of drives this off because it has a higher affinity and it opens up. And then this end is, 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 is uh, producing this actin polymerization and that makes cells move and then it comes back and it stops moving. So this is a very important aspect. And that is, that precisely there is, is uh, uh, the mutation in these X-linked thrombocytopenic patients. And so if we look at these mutations, uh, there are loss of function mutations like in Viscott Aldrich syndrome and in XLT, and there is this gain of function where the, 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 the molecule is always active in patients with X-linked neutropenia. And uh, the scoring system, uh, which is now uh, sort of updated, <coughs> would differentiate between these very mild patients with intermittent X-linked thrombocytopenia and X-linked thrombocytopenia, which have a score of less than one up to two. And they all have thrombocytopenia and small platelets and, and maybe a little bit of eczema. And then the classic viscots are a score of three or four. They have, in addition to those, they have immunodeficiency and autoimmune disease. And then congenital neutropenia would have uh, nothing except these neutropenia. And then what's important is that X-linked thrombocytopenia, also they may start out with a score of one or two, they can actually move into classic viscot in, in, in a score of five if they develop autoimmune disease, as I showed you, or, or, or malignancies. And uh, those were some questions. I hope I addressed them. Can we predict severity from the mutation? Yes, we can, but it's not absolute. There are, there are movements some with a severe mutation may be milder, and some with a mild mutation may have a severe phenotype. Test other than VAS mutations and VAS quantitation. Um, you can measure antibody responses, and if there are no antibody responses, like we do it always with VAS, we, we hit them with IVIG. Uh, variation of blood, uh, platelet counts with infections. I noticed that usually if they have infection, the platelets go up. And, uh, and my pa often patients come, oh, he's doing well, his platelets are only 5,000. Uh, uh, so it's actually not a bad sign if, uh, if they are down and the pa patients usually have no uh, additional problems. Why no bleeding even in platelet count is only 5,000? 5, I explained to you because we don't count the small, the small platelets. Uh, should we do something about this? I don't think patients should be treated with, with platelets. They, they, it's, a, it's a disaster. Uh, only when they have a severe bleed, CNS bleed or GI bleed, uh, there are now some works that bring up platelets, and I don't know how good that is. Uh, when the count are low, my son feels miserable. Why? I, I don't know. Uh, I think that's, I would just not count the platelets. So he has no excuse to be feeling lousy. Uh, what can be done to improve health during allergy season? I think, like everybody else, you go to the allergist, and unfortunately, I am not one of them. <laughs> So that's, that brings me uh, to uh, the end of my talk. That's Seattle uh, right now. Everything is blooming. Uh, we have blue skies, no heat, <laughs> no humidity. You can see people, people hang outside. And we also don't have bed bugs. That was, uh, I don't know if you noticed when you arrive in the airport, there's a big, big sign. It doesn't say how to avoid them. It says how not to bring them home. <laughs> Here in New Orleans, I've never seen that anywhere else. <laughs> so I will, I will take a shower. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you for letting me talk. I'm in the Okay. Well, um, thank you, Fabio, and thank you also, Sumati, for inviting me. I will uh, steer immediately some discussion. Uh, I was actually happy to receive this title. I'm one of those who actually is in favor of abandoning um, XLT as a term, as opposed to Wiscott, and I'm more in favor of talking about severe and milder presentation of disease, and we may discuss perhaps why. Uh, all right, so I was given a number of questions that I tried to arrange my presentation in order to answer these questions. Um, so there was one interesting question, um, and I think the interesting is mostly in the bold um, uh, phone here. What are the real chances of success for hematopoietic stem cell transplantation? What are, in, in, in general, what are the chances of survival also after stem cell transplantation? What is the recommended age to undergo transplant? What is the youngest recommended age? What is the oldest possible age, or perhaps even oldest recommended age? Uh, 
What are the most serious and not serious complications? What percentage of patients have serious long-term complications? And for how long should we be worried? Now, we're talking about a rare disease. And as it often happens when you have rare diseases, you need, in fact, large collaborative studies. And I think this is uh, something that you play a very important role in by participating at um, collaborative networks and registries that collect information on these patients that undergo transplant. This is the only way, really, uh, to make a sense of all of these questions. Uh, we also need to consider that things evolve, and uh, there are a number of variables that have a major impact um, in uh, answering your questions. So consider there is improved matching between the donor and the recipient over time. And so the outcome of transplant 20 years ago, and I'll try to show this, is not what we have now. Uh, there are available, um, there are alternative uh, available treatments um, that are as important as transplant per se, in particular supportive care, uh, pre and post transplantation has made uh, significant changes and improvements over the time. And there are also specific drugs that are now available and weren't available years ago uh, to fight specific infections as well as complications of transplant. So it is an evolving story and will remain an evolving story and we have to understand that. Okay, so what factors really affect survival following transplantation? What are the key factors that affect survival? The most important factor is probably the matching uh, of the HLA system between the donor and the recipient. But I also want to emphasize three other um, significant factors, the year of transplantation, which is something, of course, we can't control because, I mean, you're born and then you get a transplant in a specific year. Uh, the clinical status of the patient at transplantation, this is something that perhaps we can control, and age of transplantation, which actually was one of your questions. So let me review a little bit uh, what has happened in that regard. So the, the first large collaborative study on outcome of transplantation in patients with whiskerology syndrome was a study that was um, uh, produced again by an international collaborative network at the CIBMTR that collects information of patients undergoing transplant in the United States, North America in general, but also other countries in the world. And Lisa Filipovich from Cincinnati was the leading author of this paper. And uh, this is actually, let me see, what, what is, where is the, all right, uh, it doesn't project, I want, does it? No, it doesn't. It does? Okay, I don't see it. All right. So anyway, on the y-axis, you have probability of survival, and then there are, as you see here, different curves. Oh, yeah. Uh, and so these, you see, is the best survival curve, uh, with 90% um, of the patients surviving up to five years post-transplant. And really, you have mortality only relatively early after transplant, but then no patients died afterwards. So this is the best scenario. It was the actual identical sibling. Um, and then there were other curves for other um, donors. And so in particular, this is um, another related donor. Uh, so typically, it's either the father or the mother. And you see here, the survival is clearly worse uh, than the actual identical sibling. In this study in 2001, 50% of, of the patients actually died, and most of them died early after transplantation. And then you have two different curves, patients who receive a transplantation from an unrelated donor. And what is the difference between these two curves? So these were patients that underwent transplant at a young age, less than five years, pretty good survival, almost identical uh, to what you get after transplantation from actually identical sibling. This is a curve for patients who underwent transplant at over five, year, five years or more uh, of age, much worse survival with virtually, uh, you know, only 20% of the patients surviving uh, five years, and the actually um, overall survival was even worse. So that actually uh, indicates that the type of the donor, but also the age of transplantation, did make an impact. Now, this was 2001. And after that, things have evolved. And so these are the results of a study uh, that um, we undertook, um, an international collaborative study. Again, it's a retrospective study with the limitations of all retrospective studies. And Daniele Morata from my former institution was the first author. Now you see here, uh, this is focusing on patients who receive transplantation from an unrelated donor. Remember the two curves that I showed you in the previous slide, one that went very well, but the older patients that didn't do well. And now you have here, again, patients who are over five years at the age of transplantation, they're doing much better. Now we have 75% survival. So in a matter of 10 years, the results of unrelated donor transplantation have dramatically improved. And again, the reason for this is that we have better ways of um, identifying matched donors, unrelated donors, than we had you know, 10 years before. There are more donors available. 
There are better ways to prevent complications of these type of transplants. So clearly, uh, there is now a significant improvement in the uh, results of transplantation, even when you don't have a matched sibling donor, um, a matched related donor available. There are other factors. I mentioned year at transplantation. Uh, and again, uh, same, same study, and now looking at the outcome of transplant, regardless of the donor type, uh, according to year of transplant. And so before 1995, overall survival uh, around 70%. In the most recent series, around 90% or over. So again, overall improvement over time, which is, again, reassuring and I think important. Uh, the clinical status of the patient uh, at the time of transplantation has some impact. Uh, not a dramatic impact, but some impact. Uh, so this is uh, actually uh, Dr. Ock's score, uh, which um, is important in at least in defining how bad the clinical history of the patient was um, at the time prior to transplantation. So these are infants that actually had what we would call a milder form of the disease, or XLT, if you want, went to transplant with a score less than three. Uh, these are patients with classical WISCOT, but not the most severe form of WISCOT. These are patients who had developed either autoimmunity or malignancy, and so because of that, had received a score of five. And there is some difference in the survival, but again, all groups, including those that had serious complications prior to transplant, had a pretty good uh, survival rate overall, around 80% long term. So, which is, you know, reassuring again. Now, things are evolving even farther. And so, uh, one of the uh, problems that we had until recently is that the score that Hans proposed is really looking at infections, autoimmunity, and malignancies, plus eczema, as the main determinants. But, as you all know, the platelet count may also matter. And so there are patients who actually remain with an extremely low platelet count and may suffer from serious hemorrhages. So this study uh, from uh, the group in Paris uh, looked at actually uh, the outcome of patients with an early onset and severe form of whiskerology syndrome, in particular identifying what they call patients with severe refractory thrombocytopenia. <laughs> so this would be males with whiskerology that never go above 10,000 platelets, remain all the time with less than 10,000 platelets. So are these different than the other patients? Is this a special uh, risk category? And so as shown in, in this cartoon, in fact, many of them uh, uh, did do uh, rather poorly. There were deaths prior to transplants, there were also deaths after transplantation, and there were sequelae. And so based on that, they actually proposed to modify the score of Wiscott now by including this group of early onset severe uh, Wiscott syndrome where you have refractory thrombocytopenia as a key element and they identify this group of patients as being also candidates to early bone marrow transplantation irrespective of the presence of serious infections, autoimmunity or malignancies. And this is all something you know, open for discussion but I think they have a good point in here. All right, so how early and how late can we intervene? What, is the advantages, uh, what are the advantages of intervening early? What are the disadvantages of intervening early? And how late can we intervene? So there is no question uh, that you do need to use chemotherapy to perform successfully transplantation in whiskerology syndrome. But we all know that chemotherapy is toxic. And so chemotherapy is particularly toxic in very young infants because you still have a developing brain and you do have organs that are not fully capable of handling the chemotherapy. So we always are nervous when we have to propose a transplantation very early in life. The general strategy that we use is to wait, if possible, at least for six months of life uh, in order to accommodate for some more time for brain development and also prevent uh, some major risks, in particular complications of transplantation like venoclusive disease uh, which would be uh, more uh, frequent if you use high-dose chemotherapy and hit the liver early in life. Uh, there are some risks also of other, and there was a question about this, um, other long-term complications with regard to um, an impact of the chemotherapy on tooth development. Uh, and again, I mean, I should say that uh, there are data in the literature on the long-term effect of uh, using chemotherapy for transplantation. 
uh, and the impact on, uh, on, the, on the teeth, but these studies pertain to patients with cancer. And so the complication there is that these patients were already exposed to chemotherapy as part of the treatment of their cancer, and on top of that, also had additional chemotherapy, uh, and in many cases, even radiotherapy, which is a different type of treatment, uh, to prepare for the transplantation. With that caveat, there are data that, in fact, if you perform transplantation at an age less than three years, you, in fact, are at increased risk of a genesis of permanent teeth and which teeth in particular, first and second, and second premolar, but also the molars. The difference is one tooth per person. You're not losing you know, all of your premolar and molars. But if you're asking a question, is there an increased risk? The answer is yes, there is an increased risk. Now you have to balance that, to weigh that, against the risk of waiting too long uh, before going to transplant. So it's always something that has to be discussed on a case-by-case -case basis, depending on the severity of the disease. Um, but what about later age? Well, one could, one could say, well, then let's, do, let's wait if possible. But there are also complications associated with waiting too long. The incidence of graft sos disease is actually higher if you go to transplant later in life. And this is especially true if you go to transplant from unrelated donors. So in that sense, it's better actually to receive the transplant at a younger age. For Wiscott in particular, these patients, as we have discussed already you know, with Dr. Candotti and Dr. Ox, they are at increased risk of viral infections, and some of the viruses would be viruses that remain in the body forever. Uh, herpes viruses in particular, they, they remain in, in the cells of the body, and they can reactivate. And of course, that carries significant risks post-transplantation at a time when the chemotherapy hits your immune system, and then you remain totally without defenses against those viruses. So risks of reactivation of viral infections are actually higher if you go to transplant later in life because your chance of having encountered those viruses becomes higher. Now keep in mind that until 10, 15 years ago, many patients with whisker unfortunately would die of EBV lymphoproliferative disease. EBV is one of those viruses post-transplant just because of this problem. Now we do have ways to treat it, but still, I mean, the risk is there. There's also an increased risk of worsening of the disease with age because whisker is something that can hit you throughout your life, and so you may develop an immune disease, you may develop organ damage. And I showed you the slide that actually if you go to transplant with a higher score, your survival rate is a little bit lower than if you go to transplant with a much better, in much better clinical shape. So for these reasons, perhaps it's not so good to wait too long before transplantation. So a higher risk of complication post-transplant. So the general idea is that the transfer should be done uh, in the first years of life. But again, there is no golden rule here. Everything should be discussed on a case-by-case -case basis. What complications and what's the rate of complication? There was another question I was asked. Uh, so there are complications that are related to chemotherapy, and, and some of these are actually transient. Uh, they um, are relevant only uh, for some period of time, post transplant in particular, because of the use of chemotherapy, you will be in need, uh, in need of transfusional support, uh, and you may have complications related to the anemia, to the leukopenia, but you also have other types of complications that are very common, uh, post transplant, the diarrhea, the vomiting, the development of oral ulcers, but also hair loss, all of these are transient. Infections are a little bit more of a problem, again, because you're hitting uh, the uh, bone marrow, uh, you would remain without also neutrophils for a period of time. Uh, you would uh, be lymphopenic. That would expose you uh, to bacterial, fungal, and viral infections, as well as to reactivation of these viruses, CMV and EBV. In this study uh, that was done in 2011, um, approximately a little bit between one quarter and one third of the patients had infectious complications, serious infectious complications post transplant. Graft versus SOS disease is something we all worry about. Uh, there are two types of graft versus SOS disease that you probably are familiar with. That's an acute uh, graft versus SOS disease, typically defined as something that happens in the first days, 100 days, 11% of the patients had these. Chronic, which may or may not follow, often does, but not necessarily, 5.5%. This is, uh, you know, this can be very severe, uh, but, you know, this is something that unfortunately you have to deal with and quite often unsuccessfully in many cases. So this is a you know, long-lasting problem. You may develop organ damage as a result of graft versus disease, as a result of chemotherapy, I mentioned of being occlusive disease, and also as a result of infections. 
And then there was one thing that I was asked to discuss, and I will do it at the end of my talk, and I thank you because it forced me to read about this, infertility and what can we do to prevent uh, fertility in, uh, uh, in, uh, children at pre in male children at prepubertal pre age. <coughs> Other complications, so the immunity. So the immunity not only happens pre-transplant, it may also happen after transplant. There is really no correlation between the type of autoimmunity that whisker patients have pre-transplant and the type of autoimmunity that will develop post-transplant. So the autoimmunity of pre-transplant doesn't predict what you will have post-transplant. It's a relatively common complication, 14% of the cases. The most common uh, is actually the immune hemolytic anemia, which is relatively common <coughs> early post-transplantation, the first year in particular. But there's also thyroid autoimmunity, which is common. And so this is something to watch. Hemorrhages. Hemorrhages, and I'll discuss this in one slide, um, they are obvious, obviously associated with um, a low platelet count, and there are really three, three reasons why you can have a low platelet count post-transplantation. One reason is that the transplant hasn't taken very, very, very well, in particular in a myeloid compartment, including the cells that eventually give rise to platelets, you may not have a good engraftment, and you remain with your autologous cells there, and so of course your platelet production would remain low. You may have graft resistance disease, in particular chronic graft resistance disease, which may affect the bone marrow, and then you remain with low platelet count because of that. Or you may develop an autoimmune thrombocytopenia post-transplantation, and this also happens, and that may lead to a low platelet count. Graft failure, either primary lack of engraftment or graft rejection, 7% of the cases. There are also cases of declining chimerism. And so where you start with a good engraftment of the cells from the donor and that those progressively drop in terms of percentage, what does that mean? What is the implication? Well, first of all, let me um, just um, summarize here that uh, patients who receive cord blood transplantation, patients who receive mismatch transplantation, although things are improving even here, and patients with a high clinical score at the time of transplantation, these are three situations where the risk of having complications is actually higher. So these are the patients who got cord blood transplant, these are the patients who got transplantation from the father or the mother, 60 to 70 percent of them develop complications post-transplantation, which is very different than, for instance, this group here, clearly a lower percentage of complications, 25-30%, these are the ones that got transplanted from a matched sibling. And again, these are patients who went to transplant with a low score, a milder form of the disease, XLT if you wish, at a lower rate of complications as opposed to patients who went to transplant with a severe forms of the disease. So again, one reason why you want perhaps not to wait too long for the transplantation. I mentioned the drop in chimerism, and so a situation we call uh, where you have coexistence of donor and autologous cells, mixed chimerism. And now, if you look at the platelet count here and focus on the non splectomized patients, these are the patients with whisker pre transplant. These are the patients who uh, had full engraftment, so all of the blood cells in these patients are donor derived. Very good platelet count, totally normal, with some range, but virtually all of the patients had a normal platelet count. These are patients who are mixed chimera, where you have some cells from the donor, but some cells also from the patient. And in that situation, you can clearly see that the platelet count is lower. It's higher than it was pre-transplant, but it's lower. And some patients actually remain profoundly thrombocytopenic. So just to talk about spironectomy, I would not worry considering spironectomy in that setting. You really want to fix the thrombocytopenia if possible. And in fact, this is a situation now with a spronectomy that even those that had mixed chimera now remain with a good platelet count. I would not suggest and advocate to do spronectomy if you're thinking of going to transplantation. But if you remain profoundly thrombocytopenic post-transplant, spronectomy is something to consider. The other issue that is associated with mixed chimeras is a higher incidence of autoimmunity. So you really want as much as possible to obtain full engraftment from the donor. That should be your goal. Totally correct your blood compartment with donor-derived cells. Don't have any from your own. And so, to do that, unfortunately, we do have to use intensive chemotherapy. So we do rely upon what we call myeloblading chemotherapy. Because the use of reduced intensity conditioning quite often results in this situation, 
and may or may not fix your thrombocytopenia, may or may not prevent a risk of autoimmunity. So that's the only way to obtain robust and durable multilineage engraftment and disease correction. I'm showing this slide which has to do with immunization because I already expressed my opinion that if you are profoundly thrombocytopenic post-transplant, you should seriously consider the splenectomy. But in that case, you should absolutely do a proper course of immunizations. And there are now very effective vaccines. I would also add that actually the recommendation from the CDC for the patients with WISCOT are to do extensive immunization even if you don't receive splenectomy. And I think this may not be necessarily relevant for patients who are receiving IVIG because they receive a supply of antibodies through the IVIG. But if you have what you call XLT or what I call milder form of the disease, there is no question that I would strongly advocate for receiving a full course of immunization as recommended by the CDC. In my personal experience, this doesn't happen all the time. And so this is something that we as physicians the medical community, and you as association, I think we have to work together to make sure that each patient receive a proper course of preventive therapy, in this case, immunization, against a number of pathogens, which are, in fact, very important for patients with WISCOT. There was a question about influenza, and I'm glad that the question was asked. Yes? So it is important to immunize patients with WISCOT, milder or severe, against influenza, not because the influenza itself is dangerous, when you have influenza, you create a transient damage to your upper respiratory tract where we carry these other bugs here, in particular pneumococcus. And pneumococcus is very dangerous for patients with whiskers and milder or severe form of the disease. So if you happen to have influenza and you have pneumococcus in your nose, the pneumococcus may actually penetrate and may result in sepsis. By immunizing against influenza, we protect the child against influenza and prevent the risk of, largely prevent the risk of serious pneumococcal disease. You had a question? If, if they're not showing good titers, would you recommend them being immunized more? So I should say, you know, th th that's another question. So we use, uh, the titers are a surrogate measure, uh, and that's the best we have to, um, to, to, de to define whether a child has been protected against influenza. The real answer is that the only way to know that is to know whether he catches or doesn't catch the influenza, okay? So that's the only real answer. So all, anything else we do are surrogate measures. They're the best we have. I think, you know, I, what I would do, I would just recommend immunizing with a killed influenza vaccine, the shot, you know, of course, not the mist. That's enough. Don't, don't even, I wouldn't, I wouldn't personally bother measuring the title. Just give the shot. That's all what you have to do. You can, do, you can do better. That's as, as good as you can do, okay? All right, so do we have a consensus about transplant? I think I showed you that my preference would be to um, advocate for transplant uh, with severe, in patients with severe clinical score, so the um, severe form of the disease, and of those, for those patients of any age, including those very young, who completely lack expression of the protein. Those are at very high risk of developing serious disease uh, sometime in their life. Severe refractory thrombocytopenia is an indication for transplantation early in life, even in the absence of other serious complications like autoimmunity, infections, and malignancies. Transplant from matched sibling donor, as well as from unrelated donor well matched, 10 out of 10, 9 out of 10, gives excellent chances of survival and cure. Results of haploidentical transplantation, transplantation from a father or a mother, are not as good, although they are improving. And so there is further room for improvement there. You need to use very robust chemotherapy, and patients with mixed chimeries and severe thrombocytopenia may benefit from splenectomy, um, may benefit also from this other drug, romiplastim, and there is now a trial open uh, with l which is another agent uh, which can be given orally. And so it would be interesting to see what the outcome of that would be. There was a question about quality of life. I think, uh, actually, you are the best to answer this question, and there will be a final presentation today, so I'm not going to talk about that. But, of course, uh, there is a need to wait, in fact, for this study because there are otherwise no data really in the literature on the long-term quality of life of patients undergoing, with risk of undergoing transplantation. Uh, is it improving over the years or not? And finally, a question that we often um, are not asked, and so it was interesting for me to uh, look at this, is prevention of fertility 
in patients with whisker receiving transplantation. A few, you know, background data. Most of the data are actually derived with regard to the impact of transplantation and chemotherapy or radiotherapy on fertility are derived again from patients with cancer. And what do these data tell us? That use of gonotoxic agents during conditioning regimen may in fact affect the germinal epithelium and cause azospermia or oligospermia. So there is no question that the chemotherapy uh, may impact on fertility. How high is this risk? Well, the risk of infertility is dependent on the type and intensity of the therapy. High dose conditioning regimen, especially those that include um, radiation, total body irradiation, uh, may cause azospermia in over 90% of the cases. But as you know, we don't use, as a general rule, uh, total body irradiation as part of the conditioning regimen for whiskey. Azospermia is less frequent in patients conditioned with busulfan and cyclophosphamide, which has been a classical way to um, perform transplantation whisker, 50%. Uncommon in those treated with cyclophosphamide alone, 10%. You may be familiar with new strategies now to do transplantation and use cyclophosphamide post-transplant even, even from um, a mismatch related donors, so this would be interesting to follow. And although scarce data are available, it appears that also chronic graft-for-source disease and not just the chemotherapy may adversely affect sperm recovery. So overall, you know, many reasons, in fact, to worry a little bit, or maybe not a little bit, but much, in fact, about the risk of fertility. So how to preserve fertility in patients with whisker? Well, uh, there are many consensus statements by several societies that uh, now indicate that universal access should be available uh, to sperm and egg storage for patients undergoing gonotoxic therapies. Now, according to a study from the UK, though, how often is this done in practice? The number of patients who were counseled about the gonotoxic effect of transplantation increased from 42% before 1990 to 86% in the contemporary era, era, which means nonetheless that 14, 15% of patients still are not even told about this risk at the time of transplantation which I think is important. There are guidelines that have been developed by ASCO, the American Society of Clinical Oncology. Again, all of this is mostly in the cancer setting, but we can actually use some of these guidelines and apply them to the, to the whisker situation. So for adult and adolescent males, and only applies, of course, to postpubertal age, banking of sperm is the correct approach to preserve fertility. So if you have you know, a patient with whisker who is an adult or an adolescent, should, the sperm should be collected prior to the chemotherapy. Absolutely. This is what the, all of the guidelines strongly recommend. However, most of the patients with whisker will eventually receive transplant at a prepubertal age, and there is no possibility for these males to produce sperm for care preservation because they don't even have yet mature sperm. So what can be done? Well, all of this is now experimental, but there are many centers, and at least I found several in the United States, that are working on this. So one thing one could do, and again, this is all experimental, so keep in mind that we're talking about experimental approaches, is to perform testicular biopsy, isolate and store what are called spermatogonial stem cells. These are not sperm cells. They are progenitors of the sperm cells, and they, uh, in fact, you know, they need to mature farther and, and you know, divide their chromosomes be before becoming um, sperm cells. And then once you, know, you receive the transplant, uh, you are fully cured, uh, you mature, and then these cells are thawed and transplanted back into the testis in what is called the Rita testis, and they will differentiate and mature in the, low, in, the, in the right environment and eventually produce sperm and hopefully give rise, in fact, to offspring. Uh, so that's one way to do it. There are other ways to do it. Um, so this is the classical way, what should be, should be done. If you have a postpubertal adolescent or adult, you store the sperm. And then the only way, though, to obtain children would be to undergo this procedure, which is called intracytoplasmic sperm injection. So you need basically to have the egg from the donor, and you inject the sperm from the patient that had been stored into the cell, and then you implant the embryo into the mother. That's how it's, it's done. It's an in vitro fertilization through an intracytoplasmic injection of the sperm that have been stored. If you have a prepubertal male, that's what I just described, the biopsy of the testis, the storing, 
of the spermatogonial stem cells and then you know, retransplanted or even culture and then transplanted and then back into the patient. And this would be a normal fertilization now. Or other approaches, uh, disrupt the tissue, do organ culture, or the transplant, but then you have to use this strategy. The future might also be even this one, where you take other cells, and this would also apply to patients who actually have already undergone transplant. You could take skin cells, which are called fibroblasts, reprogram them to a pluripotent stem cell um, stage, and those actually can be further differentiated in vitro into spermatogonial stem cells or progenitor germ cells, or even, according to some reports, to haploid germ cells, and then be used for uh, obtaining offspring. All of these is, at this time, highly experimental. There are problems associated with this process of reprogramming. So none of this is clinical applicable at this time, but it may become a reality. I just want to give you the message that what is not possible today might become possible in the future. And for sure, this approach is likely to become possible in a clinical practice. It is still experimental. You can ask uh, you know, there are several centers, a CHOP at UCSF, many hospitals in the United States are willing to discuss this possibility with you if you're interested. And I stop here. I was just asked how much time I need. Uh, I don't know, because um, I was asked by um, Sumati to put up a few slides of uh, actually real patients, some of uh, whose parents are in the room, um, to discuss these, um, and actually discuss also within the group of uh, experts who are here. Um, on the other hand, I have a presentation on the quality of life study, the physician-based quality of life study that is going on. So I don't really know. I have about 15 to 20 slides on that. But um, let's, I think we should start with the patients. Um, so first uh, patient, is, patient is YK. He's a six-year-old. He has the R86C mutation we have talked about a lot today. No family history, minor bleeds, mild eczema, sometimes been transfused, leads a normal life with the exception that he doesn't do football, baseball, whatever, attends kindergarten with medical assistant. He has all, had all vaccines, including live viral vaccines, MMR, and et cetera. He was uh, well until the last six months since school started. He had six episodes of fever, had a septic workup each time, no hospitalization, always received IV and oral antibiotics had one pneumonia, two tharyngitis, three viral infections. So um, at age two, he had normal IgG levels, normal lymphocyte subsets. Was protein was not tested, but probably he had some. He had isohemoglutinins, and his platelets are between 15 and 25. He's routinely seen six times for every couple of months for platelet counts. Um, if he has a temperature above 38, he will receive a full septic workup, meaning uh, blood cultures and stuff. He will receive IV uh, antibiotics for two to three days as an outpatient, and then maybe some oral antibiotics. Um, he has a 10 of 10 matched unrelated uh, donor available. So what are the recommended uh, management? Again, he's six years old. Uh, routine care intervals, labs, and recommendation for the long term. So this is, um, in many cases, this is very typical, first of all. And uh, then again, recommendations will differ between uh, the centers. And I, I can give you our take or my take on it. And it might be very similar in Boston or London, but it might also differ uh, in some aspects. So if this was uh, our patient, we would probably not see him every couple of months to check, check his platelets because um, if we don't do anything about the platelets, why check them? It doesn't help. So I would probably see him every year or so and then do a more complete clinical check checkup, including platelets, including some <coughs> immune, basic immune function tests, IgG levels, and so on. 
Um, I would not recommend a septic workup for every temperature above 38 degrees. I don't know what that's in Fahrenheit. I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> And um, I would most certainly not have him on IV antibiotics for every fever above 38 because he will have a lot of those uh, within the next uh, few years. I would recommend, however, that he sees a pediatrician every time he has a, a fever. And then the pediatrician should decide um, whether he actually has a bacterial infection. And if he does, he should receive antibiotics right away. Um, about the transplant possibility. He has an excellent donor. He could be transplanted and at a qualified center he would have a very high probability of long-term cure um, and I've, I think we have discussed these um, and I think it could be done but it doesn't have to be done. Any questions on this patient? So who would make the decision? Well, at, the at the very end, it's up to the parents and possibly in the future, the child himself. Um, I have had a number of patients, not, with, not just with Wiscott, but also with other um, diseases like CGD who have basically, when they were in their teens, they have decided that they want the transplant um, and not while before their parents were just afraid to take the decision. Um, this has its downsides because if they're um, in their teens, they have a higher probability for complications. But still, um, nowadays, I think this boy could also have a transplant when he's 12, maybe. Huh? So the point I want to make is that this is a typical case where I would recommend a second opinion. Because the problem is, yes, the decision will be taken by the family, but that decision will very much be influenced by what type of information the family receives. Yes. And so I think in cases like this, it is important to get a second I completely agree. Yeah. Talk to more physicians. Yeah. I wanted to ask about the temperature and the, uh, if you will go to the doctor and he send you to uh, prep uh, test or something like that, Take time to hear the results. So it's take, it take a couple of days for normal kids. He, he, he waits like two days until until he gets the antibiotics. Will a, a, a whisk of mild whisk of can wait this time until uh, to get the antibiotics? Most of the times, yes, but because I think it's a more a clinical decision whether this child actually needs no, antibiotics. Um, and also many many of those pharyngitis are of viral origin, even if strep is uh, documented to be there. It doesn't, it's not, it doesn't necessarily mean that strep is the causing organism. Um, so yes, I think um, if he's otherwise clinically well, it can wait. Um, or if the pediatrician has the impression this is a more severe disease, he should give an antibiotic regardless of the strep um, swab. Well, we don't know. I mean, unnecessary antibiotic therapy is always bad because it has side effects and it can cause <laughs> resistance uh, of bacteria over time. So it should be avoided. And also from a family standpoint and quality of life standpoint, it should be uh, avoided to be in the hospital for every fever. Um, and, and I think that's one of the problems with, and Sumathi has pointed that out, with labeling him as mild Wiscott instead of XLT because Wiscott will always trigger immunodeficiency in any physician who has ever heard of it. So um, it's, I think it's up to the 
parents also to be educated about this and educate um, other physicians about it. Well, uh, best, best case scenario, have the pediatrician be educated as well. Have him talk to a specialist. Tell him this is a child with mild whiskot, and in case you ha haven't seen 20 other children with this problem, please contact um, Dr. Ox or whoever yeah, and talk to him. Flipping through the medical dictionary. Exactly. <laughs> Thanks. I mean, you know, we're very concerned with preventive treatment and with prophylactic antibiotics for patients with this type of mutation. And we wouldn't treat them in the We vaccinate them normally, so we treat them from the vaccine. So, like, you know, I think yeah. the approach is right. And we would have a discussion at diagnosis about, I'll show two patients tomorrow about options, which is do nothing, transplant, or and then um, we encourage them to have even further for independent counseling by transplanting by hematologists. That's the whole approach. Mm. And some of them make different decisions. You know? Yeah. That's okay. And all of them are okay, basically. Exactly. Yeah. We don't know. Yeah, thanks. Um, I couldn't agree more, but uh, taking the physician side, this is a hard thing to do because you always want to recommend the best possible treatment. Uh, but what if there are, you don't know what the best possible treatment is? And there's non or non treatment or conservative management is also a good option. So. It's very hard, and uh, the way the way to tackle this is really um, to get a second opinion, and then also, um, I mean, if I talk to families, I sit down with them uh, multiple times, and after a while, you get an impression what the family wants, and it's also sometimes it's the mother wants different different things than the father, uh, and it gets even more difficult if one of them is pro transplant, the other one's against transplant. How would I suggest trans take the side of one of them and suggest a transplant? It's very I difficult. I built my case on that because we were anti transplant And I built my case, and I'm a numbers person, and I went through the data, and I came up with my arguments before Dr. Kandani having to sit across the hospital. How many times? How many times? And I, I talked. I had an argument, you know, in sight. I convinced myself it was one moment that completely changed everything. 
And I just had that moment, and you know, we all either have it or we don't, or we question, we second guess. And we got really lucky with our transplant, so I feel great mm -hmm. about what happened for us. But it was just, I hate seeing that Kelsey family where they are. It's excruciating. It's so hard. Yeah, but I mean, if you go to the NIH annually, that's fine. I think that's you're probably on on the safe side. No, I think it's, it's not. But they do need to have this information. Yeah. They're who I see on a regular basis. That's just a question. Yeah. Always, I, I'm looking at Fabio because we've discussed this before. And, and, um, it's always difficult to publish something like this because many of these recommendations are based on our clinical experience with the patients and not on solid scientific data, which makes it very difficult to publish. Um, but still, um, we can Any try. Yeah, we can. It's also hard when the doctors, even the immunologists, when you tell them, when they get that initial, when you're that first patient who's getting ready to move across the country, and I'm waiting for that, where you say that, and then you know they're stepping out of the room with sleepy Joe, and they're Googling, and so if they don't even, if they're not even familiar with this zebra coming in the room in the first place, how are they supposed to know all of this yeah. anyway? So then that's why, you know, I don't have any letters behind my name, but I am a mom, and that's good enough for me, so that's why I do that. That's my job. If you have uh, uh, published what your organization, we can take it to the yeah. government. We won't uh, remark anything. We just show it because we are like negotiating mm. with the physician what they should do, but we don't have basic. Uh, yeah. basic but, but then again, there's also, I mean, if we write down life vaccines are safe in mild risk heart patients. Um, there could be other papers, how do you know? There is no data. Um, right, and that's why, for instance, we should set up protocols for varicella. But this, this is a constant problem for this guys they are exposed to. What do you do? Should you give them IVI? Mm. Should you give them uh, prophylactic and antivirals? And, and nobody, nobody has dared to say, uh, let's give them varicella vaccine. Mm. And one reason is, of course, we don't really know how many out of 100 would get in trouble. And if you, as a physician, make this recommendation, you are liable. Mm -hmm. But I think if one would set up a, a, a protocol 
moved by the ILB and uh, take a bunch of patients and give them Aritella and see what happens. Measure the antibodies, measure the T cell response, Aritella, and see what, what I, and it's much better than being always afraid of, of being exposed to real chicken pox. But, but this is, this one of the problems is that we don't have the data and we cannot fully make hard copies of recommendations. And on the other hand, So just to put it in a laminated form and say that's what you are going to do, is it, it's, it would be very nice to have this, but but it's it doesn't fit every family, it doesn't fit every patient. Doctor Ox has, has um, my, you know, my son John, he's, he's grown, but he has had his varicella every year, but yet he's had shingles five times. Yeah. So you know, I mean, he still gets it, but he hasn't had shingles in probably three years. <laughs> but he still has had it, so. Yeah, and it can, now we have medications coming and they help. Right, right, yeah. If exactly. the vaccine, if something happens, then. Right. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean, they will, they will have a uh, chance of getting shingles. Mm -hmm. so, so now, there, so everyone else is on the um, agenda or is on the uh, recommendation, and I think there is just, we need to find the legal. <laughs> Uh, a legal uh, uh, beginning to answer is if this is only the recommendation, it's not going to, but that, that you have even uh, an option to ask our physician about about this, this uh, subject because we are doing what the physician says, but we don't have a, um, a tool to, to negotiate. If you need to do this vaccine or not, if you need to do this lab test or not, because we don't know about them anyway. It's not to say that we have to do it, but we can discuss it with our physician. Mm -hmm. Dr. Kandani, is it, is it reasonable to have general guidelines that aren't a published data set, but general parental guidelines for things to go on a... But that's a these, are, these are things that... A family website or... Yeah, yeah these are things that like, it's a, a immune deficiency foundation with their medical advisory committee could come up with. That. Yeah. So that would be one possible way to just give recommendations and yeah. with a caveat that this is not scientifically scientific, based, but mm -hmm. this is based on case and experience and, and across the multiple <coughs> physicians across the world. And maybe that could be a starting place. And also the, the Wisconsin Aldrich Foundation could do the same. I, I, yeah. That's what I was thinking. So, so then again, what is a classic <laughs> mild miscut? <laughs> <laughs> The question that we okay. One more question, then I think we'll continue. Yeah. Yeah. There's a, a type of article in blood called How I Treat, and, mm -hmm. and that's perfect for yeah. the recommendations and for saying, what do we think you should do? Here's data that shows some of it. Here's the part we don't know, and this is our opinion. The only limiting factor is they'll only allow four authors, but you could get the people here together in whatever way, decide who the four authors would be, let the other people participate, at least in reading it or critiquing it, and that at least should create something that would be widely accepted by hematologists, transplanters, and immunologists. We did that with that. That's all I said. Mm -hmm. How we treat out. Yeah. We thought about that. Even just things of like what's all for our doctor has already many times when we're to the NIH, and I still, I still bug Buffy about it every year. Like, what should we be testing for? And it's just basically yeah. like, Things like that where you're aware of what to look out for even as parents. We can try. Yeah. Yeah. 
we'll give that a try. All right. Uh, another patient, 11 months old, same mutation, no family history, normal platelet counts of 15 to 20, no significant bleeds, no bloody diarrhea, no food allergies, had had um, all immunizations except live vaccines, but he's only 11 months old. Um, hospitalized twice for viral infections. Um, all the basic immunology workup is normal. Uh, was protein is again pending, but probably some level. Um, he has no IVIG. He was on, on Bactrim, but was changed to Dapsone, which he didn't tolerate. I don't know how he did not tolerate. Currently has no medication. He was, uh, by a transplant center, strongly advised to go to BMT with a six of eight matched um, cord. Um, again, I think up to here, management is perfectly fine. Um, I think he could probably have live vaccines. He's only 11 months old, so he can start and he will tolerate these given that his um, basic immunology workup is normal. Um, it's probably safe and it should be done. Uh, about the cord blood transplantation, um, I, I wouldn't say it's impossible, but um, I would say don't be pushed to do it because um, he probably has a mild phenotype. We, wouldn't, we do, do not know necessarily by now. He's only 11 months. Um, it might change. Um, but um, then, as I said today, six of eight is um, we don't even know if that's really a 6 of 8. We don't know if it's high resolution typed. For all 8 loci, um, it might even be as bad as 4 of 8 uh, if we look at it in detail. Um, I would probably be hesitant to, to use this type of graft for a patient with this uh, disease severity so far. Things might change. Um, there's other options. There's gene therapy option in the little further future. There might be other donors coming up. There might be safe uh, haploidentical transplant <laughs> options, with, which we are already doing uh, these days, but we don't have any published data on. Um, and there is also, he might even be a very mild phenotype and just need nothing else and be uh, live, live a happy life. So I would probably refrain from using this right now and also see other transplant physicians to get a second opinion. Okay. Can I ask you, if I can, um, can I ask you just to see the general Yeah. 
think you have the uniform opinion there is no rush to Trump. No. That's it. Well, and he, he doesn't need scepter. I mean, he doesn't need scepter. He doesn't need all. scepter. He should not be on prophylactic antibiotics. There is no reason to. Well, it's also, immunology. also because he has normal lymphocyte subsets and he has normal lymphocyte stimulation and he does, he makes um, specific antibodies. He doesn't need it. The vaccine is probably recommended because in a small proportion of classic this class we find human cystic carinia infection. And to treat that prophylactically probably makes sense for those who are Yeah. He got that diagnosis and automatically it was, mm -hmm. we'll schedule your appointment for com the consult with the bone marrow transplant. And it's like, well, you know, and then they send you right in and they put them on back from prophylactically and started us on IVIG and set us up for a bone marrow transplant. Mm -hmm. It's like, just because you get the, these three little letters, they do that automatically. And it just, I think, Um, again, same mutation <laughs> keeps coming. It's not that frequent. It is a frequent <laughs> mutation with 12-year-old, um, has a family history, maternal great-uncle died from uh, non-Hodgkin's, grand-uncle at age six from infection, and a cousin um, who had a transplant at six is doing well. He was diagnosed very early, um, was considered for stem cell transplantation at three months with an HLA mesh of seven of 10, had a splenectomy at 16 months. So I think this is probably the pre-splenectomy platelet count. It was on penicillin, septra, subcutaneous IG and lisopril. Um, he had all vaccines except the live viral vaccines. He has been admitted to the hospital 50 times for infections. Um, had the flu, varicella, shingles, um, stuff aureus, I don't know which type of infection, and strep. He had a stichostomy at age six for chronic constipation and decreased colonic motility, uh, which was removed again after six months. Um, I think we would probably need more history on that to, to really talk about that. Um, he did develop um, hematuria and proteinuria, increased autoantibodies, and was diagnosed with Wigeners, with which I would doubt. Um, and then renal biopsy showed he had IgA nephritis, which we heard was, is quite frequent. Uh, this is his current urinalysis, a lot of protein. Um, protein per, cre uh, per creatinine is also increased. Um, but he does have normal creatinine levels in the blood. Um, average platelet counts 50 to 100 after splenectomy. Normal immunoglobulins except IgM a little low. Uh, mild elevated liver, liver enzymes, we don't know why. And we don't know his lymphocyte subsets. So this is again a mild Wiscott, but he now has an autoimmune complication, IgA nephritis. Um, so he has a score five. Um, our take would be to uh, very seriously consider stem cell transplantation for him. I don't like the seven of 10 donor. I would uh, check again, because this was more than 10 years ago, I think, um, when this was checked. So he, he definitely uh, needs to have a, a repeated donor search and um, hopefully has a good donor and um, if not, he's a candidate for gene therapy or um, haploidentical transplantation in a, in a clinical study, I think. I don't know what your takes would be on that. Yeah, I think uh, the situation is, is less favorable than you know, a classic uh, 
yeah. and the four uh, you need to think about <coughs> something curative and that could be gene therapy and all the uh, unfortunately so with, with the autoimmunity there is no other thing that there's no other uh, <laughs> I don't think with the autoimmunity, um, there is no other option than trying to re restore the immune system, and it's, it's not it's just, just a platelet that you can do. Try the uh, the tipo agonist or, or a splenectomy. The, here is the issue is to uh, fix the, immune, the immunity, and uh, yeah. I think this is severe enough that could qualify for uh, for inclusion criteria for for gene therapy. Um, and so yeah so and i think even um, time wise i think he should be transplanted or gene therapy within the next 12 months to say the least because i would be afraid of his uh, kidney function because right now it's good but it uh, it will get worse uh, over the years which com could complicate which things. could actually yeah. make it a contraindication for yeah. transplant or gene therapy at some point so Yeah, the point was this is a, he also has a family history that uh, would make it easier to convince the family uh, to go oh, to transplant. Oh, Dr. Ox? Could yeah, not even a mic. Could you repeat? He did repeat. I, I just looked at the family history, uh, which is devastating. And uh, in this case, the family should actually push for a transplant. You know, one, one is survived, it's doing well with transplant, and two died. So um, this, this um, aspect of having a family decision is very easy in this situation. So I think it would be um, uh, prudent to, um, to uh, actually encourage the family to go through with say the transplant or gene therapy. Can we go through your presentation maybe? Um, shall we go to the presentation straight or shall we, there's two more patient uh, vignettes? Two more. Okay. <laughs> Finally, a different mutation. Uh, this is actually, I think it's easy. He has a, he's six months old, has two mutations. One of them is stop mutation. The other one, a missense mutation. He has colitis. He has eczema. So far, no infection, no major bleeds. Very young. Uh, low normal IgE. Lymphocyte subsets normal. Uh, stimulation normal was protein is pending but I would suspect he doesn't have any protein with this type of mutation very likely um, the HLA typing results are not very promising so far he's on no medicine he's on no IVIG he's not on he's on neocate for his uh, colitis recommendations for management I think that's the only slide on him um, this is very likely a more severe uh, Wiscott um, he already has colitis. We don't know what's, what's the um, cause for that. He doesn't have a severe uh, immunodeficiency by our lab tests so far, but this does not mean he doesn't have it, um, and it could change. So, whoops, I'm sorry. Um, so I think he should definitely go on to be transplanted or have gene therapy as soon as possible. Um, it de um, depends what the HLA typing results really are, but um, he should definitely have a, an unrelated donor search as soon as possible and uh, be considered. Um, this is debatable. Um, I would probably put him on Septra because I think he has, or other, or penicillin at least, because I think he probably has a more severe immunodeficiency that we can appreciate from the lab uh, results. Um, and if his IgG, depending what low normal means, um, if it is declining, I would probably put him on IVIG 
as well, knowing that it will be only for a limited period of time and he'll go to transplant anyway relatively soon. I don't know what your takes would be on that. We would put him on IVIG and You would put him on IVIG and septum? He's, he's almost certainly severe and needs to go to a procedure soon. Yeah. And so we will put him on maximum prophylaxis. Yeah. Why do you know he's severe? Well, well because, he's, because of the mutation. Okay, so he's got a mutation that stops the protein. So he, he, will, he will not have any protein. Okay, uh, almost certainly. Yeah. So, uh, and, probably you know, it, one, uh, six months down the road, we would probably be able to tell he really is severe, but uh, yeah, we but can't say right now, other than the mutation uh, which is very strongly associated with that. Should we yeah. the vaccine in that sense? No. It will be negative. It will be negative, yeah. yeah. He, he won't, I'm, I'm, I don't know. Do you disagree? But he will not have protein. It's interesting. The second, this second alteration is probably a SNP. Yeah. yeah. That's mm -hmm. not causing anything. Mm -hmm. It's you know, the same molecule. And I, I have seen actually this thing somewhere. It's a SNP. The, the only other thing to, in, to consider in terms of IVIG, we would give subcutaneous, and, and this is not contraindicated in patients with uh, low platelets. So subcutaneous is, causes maybe occasionally a little bit of a bleed, but uh, at that age to give IVIG is a tor torture. And so subcutaneous, you can do it at home once a week by push, easy, no problem. So last one, uh, two and a half years old, a different, also hotspot mutation for mild uh, Wiscots. He was six weeks in the hospital as a three month old with CMV gastroenteritis, uh, or, or um, not, yeah, had rotavirus, pretty severe obviously. He needed gancyclovir treatment, uh, also had platelet transfusions during that time. But since then, he has been healthy, no infections, um, had one prophylactic <laughs> platelet transfusion after running in a fire hydrant, had all vaccines, including uh, the life vaccines. Um, he does have WASP protein, probably reduced, but he, does have, he has normal immunoglobulins except <laughs> IgM, typical platelet count, lymphocyte subsets normal, slightly increased NK cells, um, management. He avoids crowded places, places, reduced contact with children who are, not, he's not in daycare. Uh, otherwise, he lives a normal life. Um, he has had no IVIG and no regular medical intervention. He has a meshed sibling whose cord blood has been um, stored, transplant or not, outcomes risk, what ideal age, what to expect, management of thermocytopenia. Um, Clinically, he would actually <coughs> qualify as more of a classic Wiscott because of the CMV infection, which is uh, not typically uh, an issue with a uh, pure XLT, but he has um, made it through that infection with the help of drugs and has now had two years of um, healthy, relatively healthy life, but still, um, um, I would probably classify him as more in between mild and, and classic Wiscott. Um, he has an excellent treatment option having a matched sibling um, who I suppose is younger. Uh, cord blood is stored, so um, we would probably recommend a transplant for him uh, from this matched sibling donor, but we would wait for the sibling to be maybe a year old, so we could um, have him as a bone marrow donor as well to either do a combined transplant or be able to do um, a repeat transplant in case the cord blood doesn't engraft very well or has poor cell viability after thawing. And what happens if you wait those another nine months until he turns 12 and it's got my pulse in one year and um, the patient still didn't have any problems, no, no medical Yeah, probably it wouldn't because um, with a matched sibling donor, he has a 
very, very, very high chance of being completely cured versus otherwise not knowing what would be his next um, complication of the disease and when it would occur. Adrian, what do you think? Um, <coughs> yeah, I'm right. It's tight. I think that's not the wrong thing to do. I think all options are possible here. Um, I know I have a mutate, a patient with this mutation who is now at university, living a normal life. They have problems. He didn't have a transplant, sorry? No. no. Mm -hmm. But he didn't have a meshed sibling, right, when he was young? Or oh, I can't think. remember. I can't remember. But, you know, he's 20-something. <laughs> he's 20-something now. Yeah. So, he, you know, his immunological function is pretty good. He has no autoimmunity. Um, I think in this, you, you could sit tight. But I, I think, you know, Michael's point, he's got a very good donor. And these days, that's a great option. And we would certainly counsel his family about the about transplant. But there is also the option of the center, right? If, if the option of the center doesn't enter your uh, discussion at all, or where, where to transplant. Well, a good center, yeah. yeah. You, should, you should be transplanted still at a center uh, which is experienced in PID transplants, yeah, absolutely. Which are not available everywhere. Yeah. What uh, ratio of match would make you not <laughs> well, if he, if he had a 10 of 10 unrelated uh, donor, I wouldn't, it's, it would, my strength of recommendation would decline a little bit, but not much. Um, 8 of 10 unrelated donor, I would not recommend to take him to transplant. Nine, ten, five, six, ten. Yeah. So you guys have put a lot on like a match sibling donor, even with XLT or, or classic, where it almost seems like if there's a match sibling donor, just like that's like the tipping point. But I feel like there's like a lot missing from the fact that it, it can't just be that easy because there's so much more that comes with making the decision for a bone marrow transplant. So do they, do the, does this family wait it out even just a year or so and see how their child is doing with the options of doing something further in life? Mm -hmm. Or do they take, not take, take, but do they go through with the bone marrow transplant just because they have a cord blood? And mm -hmm. there are long-term like consequences from that. There could be. I mean, it, it's, yeah. it's not, it's not as easy as if you have a donor. Okay, no, no, right? you're, you're pinning it down. Uh, you're pinning it down very well. That's of course. But um, I mean, uh, being a transplant, a matched sibling donor transplant is um, the best thing that can happen if you need a transplant. So that would. That's why it makes the decision to go to transplant so much easier. Even though we know with a good unrelated, the outcome will statistically be the same. It's still a less complicated procedure. And if you don't need a transplant. Well, if you don't need a transplant. Yeah. Are the risks of the transplant worth, are they worth taking? Yeah. Because of the risks of the transplant. The problem is, for him, we don't know whether, the, whether he needs a transplant. Um, we, we, we will not know until he's 40 years old and, and too old to be transplanted. Uh, because we cannot, we have no single biomarker that would help us predict his clinical course. If if we had, if we did, we'd not be sitting here. Um, but, but we but have we have the statistics, and and you have shown that 75 percent of XLT patients will have a serious event in life. So that you have to to, to to sort of put into. Not as serious. They will have an event. Well, only serious events. I don't know. I always go back to my brother and they always say this and I always tell them that obviously my, my son is already presenting differently than they did. They lived their, almost their whole lives until three years ago not even knowing. Although my mother was a different kind of mother than I am. But um, 
So you just you just made my point that it's up very important to to take the family into the discussion. Right. If you have a family history like you, you tend to not to transplant. If you have a family history like the previous one, right. where two uh, died, had died, uh, the family will automatically shift to the other end. What about and the people, these families that have no family history? Mm. <laughs> well, then. Uh, Yep. Mm -hmm. Knowing um, that uh, he's got stain B and the donor doesn't have stain B, does that change your mind at all about transplant? Um, not if, it, if it's a sibling uh, donor transplant. We would be more careful during the transplant procedure and monitor very closely. And um, also, it's, it's very likely that the donor will acquire um, CMV soon. <laughs> because because if, if he had it at, at three months, he probably didn't catch it on the subway, uh, but within the family or even uh, perinatally. So, or, yeah, unlikely. So it's very likely that either one of you has, has had CMV and the uh, donor will have it relatively soon as well. If um, it turns out that the cord blood is actually CMV negative, but the donor has become CMV positive. When it comes to transplant, we would probably tend to take some more bone, some bone marrow as well to have some CMV positive or CMV specific T cells in the graft rather than just taking the stored cord blood. But that's really a very, it's a very rare scenario that that's uh, happening, but it could be. 
Yeah. For a healthy person, it's not dangerous at all, but it's impossible to. It would be unethical. Well, how do, how do you do it? I mean, uh, practically, how would you infect someone with? It's not a mouse, so. It's, yeah, but if CMV is in the within the family, it's quite likely he will acquire it at some point. Uh, cytomegalovirus. It's, which is a one of the herpes viruses, and in uh, immune normal individuals, it causes a very mild um, viral disease or nothing at all. But the virus then persists within the blood cells for the rest of their lives. And in immunocompromised individuals, it can cause very severe and deadly infections. So. Um, in, the, for, in the early years of transplant, CMV was a huge problem. Many people died from CMV. Nowadays, with better monitoring, better, better treatment for CMV, like gencyclovir, CMV is still recognized as a problem, but it's usually not killing patients anymore. Last, last one, 16 year old, or should we discuss him at all? No, I think then I'll just go to my presentation. Okay, so um, thank you very much. Is there anybody from the UK here? No, so it could mean several things. One is that I've cured all our patients, <laughs> but probably not. In fact, I know not. So, so look, Alessandro's done a great job in introducing the uh, gene therapy protocols. They're very similar in the three centers, so it means I can, pretty, I can go through this data pretty quickly and um, just highlight points that may be different or that maybe answer some of the questions. So um, in London and Paris, uh, Again, we're using exactly the same vector. The, the uh, patients we're treating are patients with severe Wiscardology syndrome, so no uh, what we would call XLT patients. Uh, the patients would not have a 10 on 10 um, uh, donor, but probably would not have a 9 on 10 unrelated donor either, <coughs> because we know, and I'll show you in a minute, that the success for transplant in those groups of patients is very good. This is a sort of schema of how um, uh, we decide how to treat our patients with uh, with Scott Aldridge syndrome in the classical form or, or what we sometimes call attenuated uh, with Scott Aldridge syndrome, which en encompasses the XLT patients. Um, now, we'll, we'll talk about the attenuated disease a bit more tomorrow in terms of preventing bleeding, uh, but today we're focusing on classical WASP because only classical patients are entered into these studies. Um, once we identify these patients, we, we tend to do that um, in the first year of life. We do a donor search. Um, if it's a 9 on 10 or 10 on 10 match, then we will transplant them. Um, if they don't have that, then there is an opportunity to enter them uh, into the gene therapy study. Um, and now, obviously, our families get counseled about the risks of transplant and the risks of gene therapy. Now, I just want to highlight the fact that um, uh, transplant, as Michael's already said, is really successful <clears throat> in WASC and WASC. So this is just data from, uh, it's sort of a summary of data from our center, which is a specialist transplant center for primary immune deficiencies. Um, and over the last, between 1994 and actually 2015, we've treated 35 patients with classical WASC with no <laughs> mild was in this series. The survival is 100%. We've not lost any patients. Uh, but a few of the patients have developed complications, uh, graft versus host disease, as you've heard about earlier. And a couple of the patients have uh, long-standing autoimmunity after transplant, and that's um, usually chronic hemolysis. Now, you can't read this, but the, what I'll point out is that there has been evolution 
in the conditioning regimes that are given to the patients from the classical busulfan cyclophosphamide regimes right through now uh, to serotherapy in combination with darabine and triosulfan. So, and as Michael quite rightly said, the evolution of these uh, of the conditioning regime <clears throat> has resulted in much less toxicity associated with the transplant and therefore improved outcomes. Now, these aren't all um, sibling donors. Most of these are unrelated donors, 9 or 10, 10 or 10 matches, uh, and there's a few haploidentical transplants in there as well. So bottom line is transplant is very successful. Um, the, the vector we've used for gene therapy is the same vector in terms of its configuration, the one that Alessandro talked about. Our conditioning regime is pretty similar. Um, we use fludarabine and busulfan, again, at a slightly lower dose than we would uh, in transplant. Uh, and the patients may have some sort of serotherapy beforehand if they, if they have um, uh, autoimmunity. Again, you don't need to read this. It's just a cue for me to tell you about the patients. So um, to date, between London and Paris, we've treated eight patients. I haven't got any data on the eighth patient here. I'll talk about him in a minute. Um, the uh, clinical score of these patients is five in all cases apart from one. So all of these patients have had autoimmunity, some of it very severe at the time of treatment. Uh, so for example, this patient number two from Paris had very severe lower limb vasculitis and arthritis, which meant that he was unable to walk uh, at the time of treatment. And then the other patients had a mix of arthritis, um, hemolytic anemias, um, yeah, so refractory thrombocytopenias, etc. Oh yeah, patient eight. So patient eight is the most recent patient we treated. We only treated him um, uh, five months ago, but this is a patient who's 30 years old. Um, who has had a long history of autoimmunity and vasculitis and who has never um, uh, had a good donor and has actually shied away from um, a mismatched transplant. Um, so, I'll, I'll, again, I'll come back to him at the end. But he's the oldest patient that's been, that's been treated in the series. And you'll see in this group of patients, then the age is a bit, <coughs> old, a bit higher than um, Alessandro's group, uh, ranging from three up to um, 16 years at the time of gene therapy, and then, of course, the 30-year-old. So uh, we know now that uh, in these studies the dose of um, corrected cells is important, and the dose that we're giving to these patients here is between 2 and 11, by 11 million per kilo. Um, so we would now say that any, you know, around about 2 or 3 is pretty marginal in terms of dose uh, for effect, but you'll see that in fact it does have an effect. So this is just some data that I can really go over quite quickly. Um, these patients after engraftment of their cells have uh, long-lasting marking up to 50 months after treatment. Uh, so this is in the peripheral blood and then you can break that down into the different lineages and you see that the, in fact the highest levels of marking are in the T cells. Um, but there is persistent marking in all lineages, including <coughs> myeloid lineages. <coughs> These little graphs here show the improvement in um, expression of the protein in the different cells for the different patients. These are patient one downwards here. And so the shift to the right here indicates um, new expression of the of WASP protein. So you can see in T cells, that's uniform. Uh, slightly more variable in B cells, but also very robust in other lineages such as natural killer cells, which is exactly what you want to see. So you know now that you've restored these immune cells in these patients um, with functional WASP protein. Um, we can look at the uh, immunology in quite a lot of detail, and uh, again, the, the actual numbers don't matter, but I want to highlight two things, and that is if you look at the number of T cells in these patients, that are corrected is quite high. So you can see uh, the lowest uh, in this series is 34%. And then if you ask those um, T cells to do things in the lab, which means that they're sort of functionally corrected, uh, then you can see the majority of these patients are again corrected completely. Now what about platelets? Well, <coughs> um, the platelet recovery is variable. 
Um, and I think the bottom line to this is that uh, is represented on this graph here. And what this says is that the recovery of platinum numbers is probably dependent on the dose of cells that you give. So if you give more cells, you're much more likely to rec recover platelet numbers. So I'll highlight that in, in um, uh, so this patient number one, for example, so this is a London patient who received a relatively low dose of cells. See, the, patient, the um, uh, platelet count doesn't shift for many months after, um, after engraftment. And then we fix that because we, we actually do a spinectomy on this patient, which totally restores his platelet count to normal. So this patient now has a completely functional immune system and normal platelet numbers, although the platelet correction wasn't uh, due to the gene therapy, it was due to splenectomy. Then other patients have some more, have better recovery of platelets. So for example, in, in uh, patient two, which is a Paris patient, you can see the platelet numbers, although not normal, or into a range where we wouldn't worry about the risk of bleeding. So what's the clinical follow-up? Well, the clinical follow-up in these patients is excellent, apart from one patient, patient three, who died of um, uh, severe infections which pre-existed the treatment. So this is a patient in very poor clinical shape uh, prior to treatment. So, you know, in some ways, if you're treating patients with such bad disease, you expect to see some mortality. All the other patients are alive and well. Um, all the uh, autoimmune complications, apart from in one patient, have resolved completely. All the eczema has resolved almost completely in all patients. Uh, and there has been uh, no serious infections in these patients. The patient who was, wasn't able to walk um, had a major um, therapeutic effect in terms of resolution of his vasculitis, such that he was then able to walk normally again although he does still have some mild um, cutaneous um, vasculitis. So actually, I mean, if you want to do a very crude score, you can look at the, the score of the patients before, which is five in, um, uh, in most of them, three in one, uh, and then rescore them afterwards, and they're all one. Okay, so, so significant therapeutic effect in all these patients. What about patient eight? So patient eight remembers this 30-year-old um, chronic vasculitis, arthritis, actually chronic renal failure as well, so we had to dialyze him through the treatment. Um, he's now um, five months out from treatment, he's not on any immunosuppression anymore, uh, and is doing very well. Now, in answer to somebody's question beforehand, the patient eight actually had a splenectomy um, as a child, um, so had a normal platelet count and uh, continues to do so. Um, we talked about safety. We've not seen any leukemia in this cohort of patients. Um, and we can look at sort of surrogate markers to, to work out whether there's any disturbance to the way the, the blood is um, uh, being made, and we don't see that. So certainly, in terms of clinical follow-up and by the sort of surrogate markers we can use in the lab, it does, it does appear to be safe at this point, although, of course, we need a much longer follow-up. Now, I'll just show you this slide because um, this, this sort of represents the, an evolution in technologies in gene therapy. So this isn't just representing what's got Olgin syndrome. It's representing a whole lot of other conditions treated by gene therapy using old-style uh, retroviral vectors, uh, which you remember were linked to, the, to <coughs> leukemia in X-linked skid and what's got Olgin syndrome. Uh, to versus new style vectors such as the ones that were used in the wiscott olgin syndrome trial. Uh, so there's 29 patients in the new vector uh, arms, probably more than that now, 30 in the old arm, uh, and this is the event-free survival. So you can see there's been no leukemic events with the new technology compared to the significant number using old technology. So I think that gives us some confidence that um, the, these vectors are much safer. I think I'm going to, st yeah, I'll stop there. And I'll take any questions for me, but maybe we can just round up some questions for the three of us at the end.